Welcome alumni and friends of UMB's Faculty of Engineering. My name is Michelle McNeil. I'm the Executive Director of UMB's Associated Alumni, and it is my great pleasure to be your host today. As we begin the conversation, I do want to acknowledge that our campus sits on unceded and unsurrendered traditional land of the Wallastuqui. The river that runs right by us is Wallastuk, along which live the Wallastuquig, the people of the beautiful and bountiful river. And we're so grateful to be able to be here on this beautiful campus on this territory today. Wherever you're joining us from today, uh, thank you, Waliwan. We are very much looking forward to a conversation today about where the Faculty of Engineering has come over the last 15 years, or, sorry, 50 years, uh, how it's changed, how it's remained the same, and a little bit about where we're hoping to take it with your help uh, in the future. I'm really pleased to be able to welcome three guests today. We have uh, the Dean of Engineering, we have a current student, and we have an alumna of, the, of Engineering. So I'm gonna do a few little introductions before we get started. Dr. Chris Didick is a Dean of Engineering and a proud three-time UMB alumnus. During his tenure, he has continued to grow and enhance the faculty's academic plan, focusing on research, innovation, and entrepreneurship. Having earned his Bachelor of Science in Engineering, Master of Science in Engineering, and PhD from the University of New Brunswick, he has been fully committed to strengthening the institution where he spent so much of his career. <laughs> Chris was an electrical and computer engineering professor and interim dean prior to being appointed as dean in 2015. Creating a positive learning environment and, um, for our students is at the forefront of everything that Chris does and it's been a priority from day one. Chris's experience and vision has been crucial to leading our engineering programs over the last several years. I can speak to that personally, having worked with Chris on a number of projects. Thank you so much for joining us today, Chris. I'm delighted to be here, Michelle, thank you. <laughs> and Carol McCory is here representing our alumni community. Carol is a professional engineer, having obtained her bachelor's degree in civil engineering from UMB and a master's in geotechnical engineering from University of Waterloo. After a brief period as a consulting engineer, she spent 24 years with the New Brunswick Department of Transportation and Infrastructure in a variety of capacities involving highway and bridge maintenance, uh, as well as design and construction. Carol is currently the Director of Professional Affairs and Registrar with the Association of Professional Engineers and Geoscientists of New Brunswick. Carol is a volunteer member and Chief Warden of camp, for Camp 9 of the Corporation of the Seven Wardens. It's the organization that's responsible for the ritual of the calling of an engineer, otherwise known as the Iron Ring Ceremony for graduates of the UMB Faculty of Engineering. Thank you so much for joining us today, Carol. My pleasure. And Alexander Banks is a current UMB student, soon to be a UMB alumnus. Alex is uh, passionate about giving back to the community, as well as the outdoors, and the interplay between human health and assistive technology. He's entering his fourth year of electrical and computer engineering with an option in biomedical. Alexander can often be found at meetings for service groups or volunteering for various community organizations, both on and off campus. He's the current president of the Engineering Undergraduate Society, and he works with others to advocate for the engineering student experience, as well as developing initiatives to make UMB engineering more inclusive and accessible. Alexander's mother, Michelle Banks, has been an inspiration throughout his life, and she is also a proud alumna, receiving both her bachelor's and master's degree from UMB. Thank you so much for joining us today, Alexander. Yeah, thanks, Michelle. Thanks for inviting me. So now that we know each other a little bit better, I thought we would get started with a bit of a conversation. So I have a question to start with you, Chris. Uh, when many of our alumni reflect on their time as a student, I think they think about you know, their time spent in Head Hall, maybe the engineering library, uh, their professors, things they learned in their classes, but uh, maybe even some time in the Pillar Pub. Uh, but of course, we serve the public good at UMB uh, in many ways outside of our university gates. And I'm wondering if you can talk a bit about uh, the role that, that engineering plays in community partnerships and, and industry research and sort of how that, that research has grown over the years. So thank, thank you for that question, uh, uh, Michelle. So, so engineering, at, at, there's long and, and uh, uh, interesting history uh, of engineering at UNB. And uh, uh, initially, a lot of the focus of the programming was uh, to educate young people from the province uh, uh, and, and uh, prepare them to be contributors to the New Brunswick economy. Um, uh, we have moved beyond that now, and, and we're, a, we're a, a, a quality program. Uh, we compete with uh, sister universities and engineering programs across the country, and our programs have evolved 
uh, over, over the last 50 years where there has been a significant emphasis not only on educating students who bring value to the community but also uh, growing our research and growing uh, specific research within uh, UNB and within the Faculty of Engineering that has direct value uh, to, our, uh, to our community. Uh, and, and it's fairly, it's, it's quite profound. Um, uh, the Faculty of Engineering uh, brings in about $10 million of research revenue annually. Um, and that has grown significantly over probably the last 20 years, has at least doubled. Uh, that uh, also has ramifications because graduate students underpin our research. And so that means a growth in research-based grad students as well. And of course, since our grad students are paid, uh, it, 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 it is kind of a cycle. Uh, we need to bring in more revenue in order to pay those students to bring more value uh, in the research activity that we, we, we do and to bring that value to the community. Uh, as Dean, of course, I'm particularly interested in, in creating programs and facilitating those activities that bring value not only to students and faculty members within the university, but also how do we bring impact outside of the university, and particularly to, uh, to the region where, 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 we, where we live. And one of the ways that we've been doing this is to facilitate greater collaborations, collaborations between faculty and the outside collaborations that involve students and, and either outside agencies, businesses, or, or, or interested individuals. Great. So uh, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about uh, maybe some more specifics about some of the collaborative industry partnerships and how they impact students, the student yep. experience, and then also why that's important for, for our outside community. Yeah. So, uh, so I, I do see uh, uh, it's, it's like a three-way uh, three value proposition, if, if I can think of it that way. Um, and we, we, when, when, when we're engaging with industry, uh, th that engagement needs to bring value to the industry in some, in some manner. Otherwise, otherwise, those collaborations and those partnerships uh, do not grow. And then if students are involved in the collaboration, there needs to be some value that is brought to the student. And if faculty members are involved either in, in a supervisory or an advisory role, then, then there needs to be a value proposition there as well. So I, I do see significant value on the industry side. Um, uh, there's expertise at the university that can be brought to industry that industry may not have. There is student labor, I call it student labor, that can be brought to bear that, that industry may, may not have, uh, have the ability or the priority to exploit. For, uh, and, and there's also opportunity for industry to vet uh, students who may be future employees. And, and there's a lot of value in, in that because Industry does have concerns, at least in our region, in retaining students within, uh, within the region. And what better way of retaining students in the region than recruiting students from a local university? Then for students, uh, what is the value, uh, value proposition for students? Students uh, do see the opportunity for developing experience, skills that make them more employable, and potentially seeing that industry as a potential employer. And then for faculty members, it is how, how do I facilitate growing a research program that has impact? And, and industry collaborations tend to uh, facilitate more revenue. And, and that research revenue is what drives the ability to be, to be more impactful. Because you can hire and, and, and unfold larger, uh, larger programs. I always find it so interesting to hear about all the different things at play yeah. when we're engaging with yeah. our partners. Um, when, I, when you were talking, I was thinking a little bit about uh, the focus we have on experiential education for students. And so yeah. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about the importance of experiential education for our students. And then uh, maybe if there's anything you wanted to add in there around that importance of mentorship that sometimes happens between alumni and students. Yeah, so, so I, 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 I do look philosophically as well. <laughs> and, and I look at the... the the pedagogy of, of teaching and learning. And uh, 
there, there are a number of facets to having profound learning programs and, and similar ideas ap- apply on a re- research side as well, particularly with, with, in, in the context of students. And, and one is, one needs to be very clear or, or meticulous in what are, what are the skills and, and the attributes uh, that, that you, you want to develop within the students. And then, and then what are the experience that you unfold for students to be able to enhance and develop those, those skills. And then it's about, well, how do you create the environment uh, physical, social environment that that allows that activity to kind of flourish, and so I do see experiential learning as an integral part of the broader learning, uh, as the part of the broader learning uh, uh, experience. In engineering, we have uh, historically had had an experiential component that I think is really valuable, and it it is. It is the lab component of many of our, our uh, of our courses, and I do see that as as a, a, a significant distinguishing feature of engineering programs. But it's not only it's not only the lab component. We have field schools that are associated with uh, with many of our programs, uh, and then students have opportunities. Uh, or options to participate in co-op, uh, co-op experience that uh, can provide uh, real work in an engineering uh, setting uh, as they are moving uh, along a pathway towards completion of a degree program. But there are other opportunities as well uh, that include things like um, international internships, um, uh, things like uh, the participation in the diploma of uh, technology management and entrepreneurship where students not only take courses but may engage in courses that lead to the creation of a startup company and those are skills and experiences that would be beyond what would be typical of an, of, of an, of an engineering school. Yeah. Well, that's great. Uh, Alexandra, um, when you think about experiential education as a student, is there anything that Chris said that sort of really resonated with you as a defining feature for you in engineering? Yeah, for sure. So I know Chris mentioned the co-op office, and I think that that's a wonderful um, resource for students here at UNB. And I know that a lot of my friends and myself personally have had opportunities through the co-op office to go on work terms and uh, work in some really neat organizations and companies and meet some really neat people that have kind of inspired uh, a lot of students here at UNB. And I think that's something really special that UNB Engineering has. And I know the people that work at the co-op office put in a lot of work into it to kind of provide those opportunities. And I think that's really admirable and something really special here. Yeah, it's been a, a long-standing feature of the engineering program, for sure, the co-op program. How many students are in the co-op program? So we, the co-op office probably places at least 200 uh, students or more annually. Mm-hmm. Um, we, we, we have demands from our industry partners that, that, that uh, in fact, are beyond uh, that uh, because... Our industry partners are looking for co-op students year-round, and there are subtleties that make it <laughs> more difficult for for some of our students to be available during the fall and winter terms. Yeah, yeah, it would be great to see that expand a little bit. Um, one of the other things I think about with experiential education in engineering is uh, the capstone project and des- yeah. the design symposium. Uh, can you talk to us a bit about the success of those and why you think that they're such yeah. a big yes. success? Yes, so... so Probably one of the defining and distinguishing features of of, of our curriculum uh, in uh, has been uh, the e- evolution and incorporation of engineering design throughout the curriculum. And all of our programs have a, a stream of design courses that begins in year one now and culminates in the capstone design experience. It's a, a full year course in uh, in the senior year. And it is a team-based uh, uh, design, and and is a kind of a a profound learning opportunity for students uh, in in their pro, uh, in their program of study. Uh, uh, the capstone experience is intended to capture uh, many of the elements that relate to experiential learning. Uh, the course. Uh, 
is intended to address real world problems. We provide professional mentors, uh, engineers from industry who, who provide advising and advice for, for design teams. Um, and, and this culminates in the design symposium. And the design symposium has been running now for upwards of seven years or more now. Uh, and it's, it's a symposium that uh, allows all of our senior students to participate and all of the design teams uh, uh, present. Uh, there, there are booths where they demonstrate apparatus or products or services that they've developed. Uh, most all of the projects are client driven, uh, so there are external uh, partners that are involved in, in solving some form of technical or societal or, or uh, design problem that, uh, that, uh, that is an engaging opportunity for, uh, for our students. As a, as a non-engineer, I always enjoy the design symposium. It's uh, incredible work. The students really yeah. feature a lot of incredible work each year. Yeah. Uh, Carol, with your experience working uh, with the Department of Transportation Infrastructure, when you hear Chris talk about that, that sort of capstone project and working with a team, um, can, you, can you imagine how helpful that might have been when you, were, when you were a student in the career that you then pursued? Oh, oh immensely helpful. Yeah. I mean, engineering's not done in, in a silo. Uh, everything is done in teams, multidisciplinary teams. All projects, you know, start with planners and uh, land surveyors. And then you bring in some engineering. You've got IT support. You might have on a big project uh, accountants. So that working in a team and uh, learning how to develop scope and uh, how will people contribute to the overall success is, is fundamental and, and very, very useful in getting that kind of exposure and experience as an undergraduate student, for sure. So, Chris, I know that you have a, you have a bold, ambitious vision for the for the faculty and, and where it will head in the next little while. Um, and uh, maybe you can share just a little bit about that. But also, um, as I mentioned earlier, many of our alumni hold a special place in their heart for Head Hall itself. And so, maybe when you're reflecting on the vision that you have moving forward, you could talk about what what kind of space uh, things that you're envisioning too for for Head Hall. Wow, okay, thank you for that, Michelle. <laughs> Just an easy well, question for a, you. <laughs> a very, uh, so, so we've been engaged in planning for many, in fact, many years on, on uh, how to, how to make, make our programming more impactful. And so we're looking at, at growing our graduate and research programs and our undergraduate programs sub, uh, substantially. And, and we, we do see a demand and, and, and value, value particularly in the region for, for having more graduates of engineering programs, both at the undergraduate and graduate level, uh, moving in and, and being retained within our community. Uh, and in fact, when it comes to space, we're looking at uh, a capital project that is at li in the order of 65,000 square feet, I guess I should say 6,500 uh, square meters. Um, and and the, the motivation is that would, would house uh, 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 what would be modern teaching and learning facilities and, and modern research labs. Uh, but not only research labs in, in the stereotypical way we think of a research lab, uh, we, we do see the research that would be conducted in such a space as research that engages with outside partners and research uh, that has impact. That has uh, that 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 is that really has societal and direct impact, not only in this region but but uh, but throughout Atlantic Canada and and perhaps beyond. Uh, ad addressing that type of applied research is multidisciplinary in nature, and so the the space that supports that type. Of activity is quite different than the, the the space that exists within the existing head hall complex, and uh, we do see space that facilitates collaboration, uh, space that serves as a collision space between researchers who uh, and students who are, are are from different disciplines and doing work in different areas, uh, and so we envision 
uh, a new space that is open, immersive, um, uh, that um, uh, has geometries that are intentionally designed architecturally to facilitate that, uh, that, that type of, uh, of environment. Um, and so we're, we're well on uh, a pathway for unfolding what are, what are designs for such space. The other, uh, although many of us have, have fond memories of the Head Hall complex, uh, the Head Hall complex is not a single building, it is many buildings. And, uh, and uh, for me, as an alumni uh, uh, in electrical, the electrical engineering building, it was historically the original mm -hmm. UNB gymnasium. Burned down, was rebuilt. Uh, that building uh, was rebuilt in 1904. That, the building still uh, <laughs> serves uh, uh, the, the faculty and that department well, but but we're, we're at a crossroads where we, we do need to move, uh, move into more modern, uh, more modern space and an environment that, that is less compartmentalized and embraces uh, uh, a greater level of diversity and interaction, which is, uh, which is basically the future of engineering. So as Carol had mentioned, many projects that our students are gonna be in, engaged in are are, are not going to be disciplinary specific. Uh, we, uh, we live in an increasingly complex society. Uh, technology advances at a rate that is unbelievably fast. Uh, our ability to adapt to that technology, although we think we adapt quickly, is unbelievably slow. Uh, and and there, is, uh, there are requirements to facilitate synchronizing the two, and that's where uh, uh, cross-disciplinary, interdisciplinary, uh, and intentional uh, interdisciplinary activity can facilitate uh, m training our students and preparing them to be able to, to, to work and thrive in such an environment. I love thinking about the, the space being opened up a little bit and, and yeah. creating more collision space for our students and our researchers and our industry partners. Uh, as someone currently doing their studies in Head Hall, uh, Alexandra, how do, you, how do you feel about hearing that vision for what it might be? I'm really excited about it. I think um, it can, like Chris said, it can definitely have a big impact on how much of an interdisciplinary approach there is taken in UNB. I find that um, as great a job that UNB does right now of kind of bringing different uh, disciplines of engineering together and um, like you have a lot of electricals working with software on different senior design projects and things like that I think a space like that would even increase that more another thing that I um, would really like to see is I'm, I'm really fond of the head hall building like it is right now um, but it's definitely not super accessible to students and um, like it's not there's not many ramps or anything like that in between kind of the different buildings that have been merged together. And I think that would be something really nice to see in the new building would be to have um, a more accessible environment where um, that's a little more inclusive to all students. Yeah. 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 Accessibility absolutely is, is a requirement moving forward, I would think. Yeah. Uh, Carol, I'm going to take a break from asking questions. I know a number of our alumni submitted some questions that they wanted asked, and we thought uh, the best way to do that would be to have a representative from the alumni community in engineering asked those questions. So I'm going to hand it over to you. All right. Well, thank you. Um, the, the first question I received was, uh, it's actually two part and it's uh, directed to you, uh, Chris. Um, how have the faculty's course offerings changed since the early 70s? And how do you feel they should change in the future? Oh, my. Um so I lived in that era, so I can, <laughs> I can reflect fondly on what, uh, what existed there. So, um, so originally, uh, engineering programs were five years. Uh, you, you, all students did the first two years, so fairly common first two years, and then students kind of moved into their disciplinary, their areas of, of spe uh, uh, specialization. Um, uh, you were assessed year by year, so you, you, you graduated from, from one year to the next, or you did not, uh, and you would repeat the entire year if you were not successful in a given year. Um, in uh, about mid-1970s, uh, we, we moved to a course credit system, uh, and, and at that point it was around 180 credit hours was the minimum number of credit hours to be accumulated to, to, to graduate from 
uh, a degree program in engineering. Uh, that, uh, that amounts to about six courses per term for each of eight terms, which compared to other degree programs is a, is a very heavy workload. Um, first two years, uh, typically students would do courses that are fundamentals. First year would be more common. Um, and then the last two years would be more disciplinary specific courses and perhaps some courses of breadth in the humanities, uh, perhaps business courses uh, uh, and profession, profession and law courses, for example. Um, and then uh, about 10, 15 years back, uh, there was uh, a, a, a slight change in, in the 180 credit hour requirement. It dropped to 160, compatible with many of our sister schools of engineering across the country. And 160 credit hours basically meant the program could be completed in four years, but doing five courses, on average about five courses, full courses uh, per term for, for eight terms. But another thing kind of happened to our curriculum at that time as well. and. Uh, it was recognized that uh, a, a lot of our degree programs were becoming kind of specialized and compartmentalized. And there, there was, and this was across the country driven by our accreditation body and, and, uh, and, and other uh, uh, discussions to incorporate uh, engineering design within the curriculum. And engineering design is, is more about open-ended problems and addressing them from many, uh, from many dimensions. And so uh, the curriculum in all of our programs has kind of evolved over the last 15 years where we have, uh, and this is very distinct from what existed before, is a very clear pathway through degree programs where engineering design principles are taught from year one through year, uh, through year four. And, uh, that, that has created some uh, opportunities as well where, where not only does one focus on engineering design and open-ended problems, uh, but it's allowed uh, incorporation of other elements of learning that might not have otherwise been a consideration like innovation and value creation and how you incorporate societal value in decisions that are made as part of a design, as part of a design process. And that value creation need not only be monetary value, it, it could be if one is moving on an innovation pathway that leads to entrepreneurial activities, but, uh, but value, uh, 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 creating value is, is more broad, uh, from an engineering perspective, is more broadly than simply uh, business value. So there's environmental mm. considerations, climate, for example, considerations, uh, societal uh, considerations. Uh, an awful lot of multidisciplinary yeah. in the context of the courses, in the context of the co-op program, the TME, the, the uh, work abroad, all of that. Um, as an experienced engineer, I can say I'm almost daily um, recognize and see just how broad the reach is of the engineering program is around the world and what all those engineers, the, the varied roles that these graduates of our UNB engineering program have, have taken um, and much encouraged to hear this, this so. approach that, that allows the critical thinking to develop and the problem solving and the, the work within the teams and collaboration and all of that. Wonderful. So, so teamwork, uh, uh, team, teamwork and leadership skills are an integral part of that, of that design experience. And, and we do see this as being really important when you move into, uh, into, into a work environment, uh, particularly uh, where, for example, with large engineering projects, there, there, there is teamwork and collaborations that are not simply dealing with engineering or technical issues. There are broader issues that relate to uh, environmental, that relate to indigenous uh, concerns, that relate to the impact that a large project may have on, 
on landowners in proximity to, to where a development, for example, might take place. Absolutely, baked right in there. And, and, uh, and we do see our students being, uh, playing pivotal roles in each of, each, each of those domains, or at least having a deeper awareness of those issues so that they can be incorporated at very early stages of a design process. Yeah, certainly. Uh, on that, uh, what the people side of things, um, diversity of people, yeah. what programs or what approaches has the university taken to ensure inclusivity and diversity of the engineering um, population? Uh, yes, very good question, Carol. We, uh, so, so the university has developed an action plan and, and that the action plan addresses uh, uh, the, the, the four, what, what do we call it, the four classes of, of, of people, women, indig indigenous people, uh, uh, people with disabilities, and visible minorities. And how do we create an environment that is inclusive uh, for that diversity, uh, that incorporates that diversity? And so we, uh, we have hiring practices, for example, where uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion is, a, is an integral part of the hiring process. Uh, but I, I look at EDI uh, as a dean and within a faculty, uh, I, again, I look at it kind of more strategically. So uh, in engineering, we do have a diversity issue within, within the profession and, and uh, within and within our engineering schools as well. And so I, I look at it as how do we affect the intake, uh, intake of students? How do we incorporate that in, in the intake of faculty and staff? Okay. And then how do, you, uh, how do you create a welcoming environment uh, where you have this collective of faculty and students and others, uh, partners and collaborators uh, that are part of that broader community. And then our, my hope, at least as a dean, is that kind of permeates as students move into the profession, that that will transform as well the profession. So on the intake side, we, we have an outreach program where, where, where we develop programs and interact with young people uh, that is specifically targeted to young girls uh, and, and women in middle school, elementary school and high school and ensure that they're, they are, and hopefully their parents as well, yeah. are properly informed of, of what, what the profession of engineering really is about. Uh, and to engage them in activities that will inspire them uh, as they go through school to pursue those courses that may prepare them to enter uh, the engineering profession. Uh, and then I'd al already mentioned that we do have a framework at UNB for a hiring process for intake of faculty and staff. And then we're, 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 we're in stages of developing uh, uh, a more uh, strategic framework within the faculty for creating a welcoming environment. For example, we have on the student side, uh, we, have a, we have a society that is uh, diversity within engineering society where the focus is to address concerns uh, related to equity, diversity, and inclusion. Thank you. I'd be interested, now, Alexandra, in, in your um, experience, uh, has, uh, have some of these initiatives permeated to the point that they're perhaps transparent to you and you, how, what, how do you feel? Yeah, for sure. So I think um, the efforts of the faculty and the students together have really like are shining through right now. There's a lot of um, uh, work right now towards accessibility initiatives and programs and that kind of thing. I also think there's still a lot of work to be done as well. Um, I know this year for, for me personally as the US president, I'd really like to partner a lot with that um, organization, uh, Diversity Within Engineering. Um, and currently right now we're working a lot to kind of brainstorm some ideas of how um, we can make more accessible assessments for students and um, make engineering more inclusive to students with accessibility requirements. Um, I think I agree. Like. I think if we start working on those kind of programs and initiatives now within 
at the undergraduate level that, like the dean said, that'll perpetuate upwards into creating more inclusive and diverse um, environment for um, in the engineering career as a whole. So kind of like sparking that now at the undergraduate level is something really important. Um, I think that, yeah, like we're doing a lot of great work right now, but I think it can still improve a little bit within the coming years. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. The, the, the shared vision between both the faculty uh, administration and the student body is, is, is wonderful. Thanks. So that, Thank you. That's great. I'm curious, how, how did you choose UNB? Um, okay, so I guess for me personally, there is a lot of uh, little things of UNB that added up. So I know for me, my... Um, I came here on a campus tour once, and just the charm of the university, like the brick walls and the the beautiful trees just kind of hit me, and I was like, wow, this is beautiful. And um, another thing that really struck me was the faculty engineering is uh, really well known across Atlantic Canada and also in Canada, yeah. and kind of um, the, the ac at, at the academic side is really good. Another thing that really struck me was um, the trail system in Fredericton. <laughs> um, I love I love running and I run almost every day and the trails here there's like 80 kilometers of paved trails and I was like wow if I go there I can run on those trails every day it'll be great and um, but really um, at the heart of it the, the thing that struck me the most was um, like the positive and welcoming environment that surrounds UNB engineering and also just UNB as a whole. I know when I came here um, in the winter before my first year there was some orientation events and like the energy and positivity and kind of um, community atmosphere that kind of radiated from the students and the faculty uh, was just incredible and I was like wow this this is like a really special place yeah so that's why I chose it oh awesome yeah yeah and and it's nice to know that 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 special feeling that i felt like 40 years ago still exists you know there's new newer buildings including this beautiful facility we're in today yes. um but but it's about the people isn't it and that welcoming environment yes, lovely for sure. yeah Thank so you sure. you're studying uh compute electrical and computer engineering yep with uh, an option in biomedical and uh, what, are, what are your future plans? What, what do you see that, where does that going to take you? Or? Yeah, for sure. So, um, yeah, like you said, I'm studying, uh, I'm taking an option in biomedical engineering right now. And that's because I'm really passionate kind of about the interplay between human health and assistive technologies. Like throughout my whole life, I've always been interested in um, just kind of how we can help to create a healthier and um, society and using technologies to do that. And... In the future, I would, I'm really hoping to pursue a master's in biomedical engineering um, to be able to work with others to create a more proactive uh, healthcare system. So that means, um, like right now, the healthcare system is very reactive. So if you have had um, some kind of illness or an accident, you come in and you're um, looked at afterwards. But I would really like to work with um, at like kind of leading edge of technology to create more right. a more proactive healthcare system that that would be done by um, creating devices that like continuously monitor people um, to make sure that um, we're before someone deteriorates to the degree where they have to come in and maybe they can't be um, looked after under like a, a reactive healthcare side. It's it's more like proactive. So that's kind of what I want to work in in the future. I am thrilled you will be there for me oh, <laughs> in yeah, the future. Thank Thanks. <laughs> Alexander, I have some questions for you that I'm wondering about. Um, when I was a student, uh, I think back, uh, you know, obviously this time that I spent in my own courses were, were influential, but the time that I spent involved in the community and the leadership roles really helped to chart a path for me for my future. And so I noticed that this year you're going to be the en Engineering Undergraduate Society president, and I'm just wondering what... what encouraged you to do that? What, what made you uh, put up your hand and say, yeah, I'll, I'll lead that group? Yeah, for sure. So um, there's a lot of reasons why I became involved with the EUS and also ran for president. Um, but I guess it really just kind of boils down to three main reasons. Uh, the first one is, I think for any l leadership um, position, I think it's, it's really exciting to be able to um, work with students to give back to the to what's already built there for you. So like, I know for me personally, when I came into first year, I was amazed by the amount of effort that um, upper year students put into kind of creating a, 
a welcoming and inclusive and really positive environment within UNB Engineering. And I really looked up to those students and I was like, wow, I'd really like to get involved and uh, give back to, to the students that are currently within UNB Engineering and kind of follow the footsteps of those people because like they did so much for me and I was really thankful for that. So that's kind of like the first reason why I really, um, I wanted to, I became involved because I want to work with other people and really just kind of give back to the UNB student experience. Um, I think the two other main reasons in my eyes are for why I wanted to get involved were more things that I wanted to see change within UNB engineering. Um, first off, as we've already talked a lot about, I think there's still a lot of um, work that needs to be done towards um, embracing diversity within engineering. And I think that's something that I would really like to work with the whole student body to kind of create a more positive and welcoming environment for everyone um, who is coming to UNB Engineering and making sure we're um, embracing diversity at the undergraduate level and also at the professional level is something that I'd really like to see. And I'm currently working with a lot of students on kind of developing some new initiatives that we can hopefully put in place into fall 2021. Um, and also the other side is, I know for me personally, I take a lot of classes, uh, technical classes, so I learn a lot about like the math behind why things work and um, there's a lot of great design projects and that kind of thing. But I would really like to um, learn a little bit more about the impact that engineering has on the environment. So I think as an engineering profession, we know how to build things, but we don't always know how that impacts the environment. And I think we can take a little bit more of a sustainable approach to um, the engineering design process. And that's something I'd like to see change a little bit within UNB engineering is, um, I think right now it's really great. There are quite a few courses offered um, for sustainability, but I think at the student level, we can probably promote, um, have some more workshops for um, promoting sustainability and kind of um, promoting that at the undergraduate level for people know how you can approach the engineering profession sustainably. So yeah, those are kind of like the different things that I, um, that kind of motivated me to become involved and run for EUS president. Really impressive to hear you talk about that. And similar to Carol, I'm really glad that you're going to be, uh, you're going to be helping to lead, lead us in the, into the future. So thank you for that. Thank you. Um, so one of the things I, I can't end the, the, this conversation today without talking a little bit about one of the biggest concerns we've heard from, from alumni over the last 14 months. Uh, alumni have been uh, very concerned about the student experience in the context of COVID-19 and the really quick switch that you would have had to have made. I mean, our faculty had to make it, but our students had to, had to adapt too. I'm just wondering if you can talk to us a little bit about uh, what that was like. It's, a, it's an experience. Well, many of the things you've talked about, we can, we can uh, you know, commiserate, not commiserate, but we can uh, understand. We, I can't understand what it would be like to be a student uh, in university during COVID-19. Can you help us with that? Yeah, for sure. Thanks for the question, Michelle. Um, so I was actually talking to my roommate about this just a, a few days ago and we were just kind of recapping on the year and I know that the the experience is definitely is definitely different between students like some people liked online some people didn't personally I was not a fan of online learning and I for me I'm someone that really likes to go and I like to do my labs hands-on and then I like to walk to my class and kind of have some interaction with people and as the dean said, like UNB really is really proud of like the the lab side of things, and that's something I really miss. So like having to sit in front of my computer for five hours for class, and then having to sit for three hours for my lab, and then having to sit for however long to do some assignments um, was really difficult. And I think it was difficult for a lot of students this year. But I did find that I had a lot of uh, personal growth, and maybe. Uh, learn things that I wouldn't have if I had been in person. So I learned really how I learned um, best. So like I made sure to take breaks and continue running because that's something I really enjoy doing and making sure to do that in the mornings to like wake up and be ready for the day. And also switching up my space. So like I know uh, I found it really hard, especially for a semester. I was caught often just going to my desk in my room and working and um, then going on with the day. But I found like that was switching up the space so I would make sure to go to the library or go to a cafe and kind of change it up really refresh it was like really refreshing and yeah so I definitely found it difficult but I admire like every single student that has gone through this year for like their dedication and perseverance and um, amount of effort because I know it's been a challenging year and there's been a lot of uncertainty and I, I, it's really quite admirable and I'm, I'm proud of every student in my uh, around my year so yeah. 
Yeah, we're proud Thank of you, you too. And, and honestly, when what made me think to ask that question just now was listening to you talk about the passion that you have for being involved in the community. And, and of course, we were worried that when students were not learning on campus in person that we would lose some of those things that are kind of part of the DNA of the UMB experience. But it was really encouraging for me to hear that they're still the students are still involved in, in making the university a, a better place. So really great, really great to hear that. Yeah, for yeah. sure. <laughs> so I, I do, so, so COVID has, has yeah. been a, a crazy time. Yeah. It's difficult for everybody. Yeah. 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 And, uh, and when it first happened, I was really kind of concerned about is the technology going to yeah. be able to survive this? Like, is, mm -hmm. is everything going to kind of fit? And it wasn't the technology. The yeah. technology went, it worked fine. Yeah. I was amazed. Yeah. Yeah. The, the challenge that we had is how do you get people connecting with other people? Yeah. Faculty connecting with students, students connecting with students. Um, and I've, in, I've encountered exactly as you said, Alexandra, students who are, are adapt well and I love this way of learning and I wish we could do more of it. And then other students where it's been a hard, yeah. hard struggle to, to, to keep spirits up, yeah. to, to be healthy from a physical and, and mental uh, perspective. I'm supervising graduate students who uh, some have adapted well, some are from Fredericton, some are from outside of the country. And it's difficult when you're self-isolating and you, you can't yeah. mm. connect with, uh, well, you can only connect with a limited number of people. So, so it's been a real challenge with our students. But I'm amazed because uh, with students, at, for the most part, have been very resilient. And faculty members have been very resilient mm -hmm. to the point where uh, when I first became dean, I was looking at, you know, we should do more online <laughs> learning because there are some fundamentals that are taught in engineering that you could do online yeah. uh, really well. And, I, and, and then you have the experiential part where you come to campus and there are faculty members who facilitate that. But, but when, when uh, before COVID, it, it's hard to have, <laughs> you know, yep. a larger community think about that type of change. Now is a perfect time for that conversation because we now have faculty members who know what it's like to teach and where are the pitfalls, but where are, where are the opportunities? Yeah. And so I think even though it's been difficult, I think what will come out of this are some really positive yeah. uh, uh, changes to our program. And, uh, and I do see the future. This is one of the things I didn't talk about was that I do see the future of engineering where uh, the, the walls, the, the disciplinary walls kind of disappear. They, they kind of become more and more invisible over time. Uh, and uh, the fundamentals will be taught using cloud-based virtual augmented reality. And then it's the experiential part yeah. that you come to, to be part of. And it's exactly as you've said, Alexandra, it's, it's you, you need to be able to work in teams uh, to have opportunity to, to lead. For example, EUS as a leader, that's a, I don't only look at EUS as a model society at the university, I look at it as an opportunity for many students to, to move through pathways that allow them to become leaders that will, will bring value when they leave the university as well. Yeah. yeah. One of the so. things that I think coincides a little bit with the uh, future, with online, more online learning too, is issues around accessibility yeah. and inclusivity, yeah. like just being able to fit a bit better for, um, you know, a big, I've been told that a big challenge for Indigenous students with coming to university is that barrier of having to leave their community behind, uh, right? And so if we can have... It's complex. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. A, and then, it's a real challenge to get all of the pieces yeah. that, that, that facilitate uh, what, what for that community is a welcoming environment. Yeah, it's, yeah that's it's right. It's complex. Yeah, and then you think about people that might have, you know, jobs that they're trying to hold, yeah. hold while they're going to school. I just think having a few online pieces in the future yeah. would it, be really helpful. It, it, yeah. it adds flexibility yeah. uh, that, that is good for students and faculty and programs as yeah. well. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah, exciting to watch that, that happen. And just to add to what the Dean was saying, I think um, I'm amazed by how much uh, the UNB students have like, are involved with the community uh, within UNB and outside of UNB and still did that during the pandemic. Like I know, um, like it's all volunteer and there, there were still tons of 
um, societies and clubs and volunteer groups running, um, even during COVID. And I think that's something really admirable. And it, it definitely happens um, even more so during in-person um, course delivery. But I think it was really neat to see that there was still a group that would go to the YMCA yeah. and do work with um, children there. And then there was another group doing like uh, promoting research at the undergraduate level. And there's a lot of fantastic groups out there that are still doing work um, as students volunteering and giving back to the UNB community. And I think that's really admirable. Yeah, we just finished reviewing our applications for our alumni legacy and alumni leadership scholars um, this year. And we, were, we didn't really know what we would get compared to other years, right? Because yeah. it's all yeah. focused on your extracurriculars. And, and they came in and I was just like, look, they found a way to do it. Yeah. They, they figured it out. So uh, I think that just about wraps up the conversation from my perspective. An hour went by incredibly quickly. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Chris and Carol and Alexandra, for being with us uh, for the last hour or so. It's been a perfectly lovely way to, to spend an hour. Uh, I hope that our alumni who joined us also enjoyed hearing a little bit about where we've, where we've come in the last 50 years and, and where we might be headed and hearing perspectives from our students and, and our faculty and our alumni. Um, I do hope that one day really soon we can uh, invite you all back to campus and particularly into the, the, the many uh, levels of Head Hall uh, someday soon so you can come back and, and be back in that space. But in the meantime, I do encourage you to stay in touch with us if you have any questions about UMB or the faculty that, that you would have asked if you had been here in person today. Uh, please be sure to send those to us at alumni at umb.ca and, and we'll do our best to get a, a solid answer back to you. Uh, but in the meantime, I hope everyone has a, has a great day. Thanks again for joining us.